If you want to understand what the firewall paradox is, I, th I think you're going to have to ask the panel la later on. Uh, David Fink Finkelstein, it's great to, to meet you here. David, you told us 56 years ago that in general relativity the horizon is not a barrier uh, to anyone, even though Einstein himself thought there was a barrier, so thank you for doing that. And now we're into quantum gravity and we apparently think some of us think that there is still a barrier at the horizon. Now, this is an accurately ray traced calculation of falling into a black hole. This is from outside the black hole and this is from inside the black hole. So, Seth, you did a great job of, of waving your hands around, but this is accurately ray traced. Uh, this is <laughs> these, this red grid here is the horizon and this red grid here is also the horizon and when we fall through the horizon, this is also the horizon something very interesting happens. Did I call this a horizon? Actually, it isn't a horizon. It's the red exponentially redshifting surface of the star that collapsed long ago, or indeed anything else that has collapsed into the black hole uh, it, 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 that has happened. It continues to redshift exponentially into the indefinite future. When we fall through the event horizon, which is the future event horizon, uh, we don't get to see the future event horizon until we've actually fallen through it. And we see that the redshifting surface of the collapsed star, which I like to call the illusory horizon, is still ahead of us. If you want to ask where is the quantum mechanics going on here, where is Hawking radiation coming from, it's coming from this, it's coming from the redshifting surface of the collapsing star. For fundamental reasons, when an observer is watching an object that is accelerating away from it exponentially, then the pure frequencies in the vacuum of, of this and the emitter's frame are trans fully transformed into a mix of positive and negative frequencies in the observer frame and we turn that handle, one gets Hawking radiation out of it. So you can see from that there is a distinction that one must take between the event horizon and this illusory horizon which is, looks like a horizon but is merely the illusion of a horizon, it's the redshifting surface of the collapsed star. So if you ask what is wrong with the, what is wrong with a firewall, the set of postulates that produces a firewall, I would say it is a postulate that is so obvious that it hasn't even been mentioned, which is the idea that the horizon is something that is independent of the observer. No, the horizon, in particular the horizon on which quantum mechanics is taking place, is the illusory horizon. It's the redshifting surface of the collapsed star. So when I read in the archive, I go through the, uh, Often I only need to get as far as the abstract on a firewall paper and I, I see the horizon or the interior or the near horizon zone being mentioned in a fashion that suggests that they are observer independent, then I know immediately, well, unless they've defined their terms more carefully, uh, I suspect that there's a confusion going on here between the event horizon, the future event horizon, which is not a source of Hawking radiation, it doesn't carry the states of the black hole, it's incapable of doing those things, and the illusory horizon, which is. All of these things are observer dependent. So here is a Penrose diagram, which is coin of the realm in these kind of arguments, and I'm sure that many of you will say, oh, you shouldn't draw it this way, or you shouldn't draw it that way, uh, and some of these things are, uh, okay, so here is an outside observer watching Hawking radiation coming from the illusory horizon. This looks like Schwarzschild. Actually, you should think of this as the exponentially redshifting surface of the star collapsed long ago. Let's imagine Alice, I haven't drawn her, but she's inside the horizon. Let's put her here. And I put, if I put her here and I ask if locality holds between Alice here and the outside observer Bob here, well, they are in a region around here where the curvature is rather small, there's no singularity nearby. One expects that to be able to do experiments in the laboratory, talking to each other, having cups of tea, Alice and Bob can get together, their future light cones intersect. I would hold that, that locality must hold in the traditional sense commutation of space-like separated operators must hold in, in this region here and Bob. So the only region that can be responsible for the Hawking radiation that can be non-locally connected to, uh, the, to, to Bob, so that he sees in the Hawking radiation, can be this piece that I've drawn in pink. This int here is the interior of the black hole. This, this is, is, is not an option. You must require that locality hold in this region uh, as far as Bob is concerned. And you can see this region outside the domain of locality, which intersects the singularity before Bob's future light cone intersects it. So this is sort of causally out of contact with, with Bob. It is only that region which uh, 
can be entangled with Bob and the Hawking radiation that he can see. And again, it is, this is observer dependent. General relativity predicts that there is a firewall, but it predicts that there is a firewall at the singularity, not at the horizon. This is again accurately ray traced uh, for an observer who is approaching the singularity. The red grid is again the illusory horizon. This is the red shifting surface of the star that collapsed long ago or anything that collapsed into the black hole before. And this is the, uh, uh, this is the true horizon above you. This is the future ev event horizon. And interesting, when you approach the singularity, it does not appear to look like a point. Because of the enormous diverging tidal force, it actually looks like a flat pane, both the illusory and the upper horizon. When you fall into a black hole, and uh, your friend falls into, into a black hole uh, on a neighboring angular pathway to separate it, your, your 3D intuition suggests that you would meet your, your friend at the, at the center, at the central singularity. That, that is not the case. The enormous tidal forces essentially keep you apart from each other. So the appearance of this thing as you approach the illusory horizon, is, as you approach the singularity, is that you actually... Um, uh, you actually reach this illusory horizon and this horizon, the affine distance between you and this and between that and that goes to zero. So it's interesting and I think one should pay attention to what gen gen accurate general relativistic re visualizations are showing. This is what it looks like and it looks like a holographic plane. I'll stop there. Thank you. I think this is really rather general comment about this whole set of issues. I think a lot of confusion would be dispelled if people would stop using particle language and refer instead to something that's well defined, which is the local value of the renormalized stress energy momentum tensor. So energy density is energy flux. They're defined uh, completely rigorously at each space time point. And when you talk about you know, where does the Hawking radiation come from, what's happening in, at this surface or that surface, you get the answers, you just calculate it, and they're right there. Doing the calculation in four dimensions is tough, but in a one plus one dimensional model, you can nail it all down. It's all there. And a lot of this confusion will go away if people just concentrate on that and stop using particle language. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Paul. I, I agree with a, a lot of what you said. We have a very simple situation here. This is Schwarzschild geometry where the, the, the energy density is, is vacuum, of course, and, and we're assuming in this case that the back reaction is at least in the regimes that we're talking about rather small. When you get to the singularity, th things change tremendously. question I asked said, um, I think the answer here is yes. Uh, if, uh, but, um, if near R equals zero, in the in, in, in people's uh, the metric would be very different because of the effect. All these people remain the same, right? Yes. I think there's a, the, 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 I, I haven't given a single clue about what happens where locality breaks down. I think the, the important thing is that locality is breaking down between the singularity and, and elsewhere, and maybe near the singularity, but I, I'm completely agnostic as to the nature of that breakdown, and it really doesn't matter. There's still an information paradox of how to understand how locality breaks down and how Hawking radiation can be non-locally emitted to the outside universe. Okay, so I'll be talking about this set of issues from the point of view of a post maldacena string theorist and uh, updating this idea of uh, black hole complementarity. Um, so here's the uh, picture that we've uh, seen before. Um, we have um, an evaporating black hole that shrinks down to, to nothing. Eventually the horizon uh, collides with that uh, jagged line a and the black hole shrinks down to, to zero uh, energy. Um, during that time, Hawking radiation has been emitted. And the, the problem we have is that uh, we can have a, a smooth initial state that happily propagates across the horizon all the way to the singularity. And uh, once, once it enters this region, we, we, we don't really have any rules for uh, getting that quantum information from this region into the outside region. So that's the essential statement of the black hole information paradox. And there, there are various ways uh, around this. Um, 
we might have some kind of non-local mechanism for getting the information from inside into the Hawking radiation during the course of the evaporation. An older idea was that all the information came out at the end where obviously strong curvature effects become important. But we, that would lead to the idea that we have lots of light states in our theory and that gives rise to lots and lots of other problems. So the most popular idea is that somehow during the course of the evaporation, um, the information comes out. So the question is, um, what, what are the implications of that for someone falling through the horizon? So the, the basic ingredients that I'll work with as a post-Maldacena string theorist is this kind of holographic description, and I'll work with the most efficient one for my purposes, one that gives the most um, number of dimensions for free, so um, I'll only have to reconstruct one dimension holographically, um, and the kind of holographic theory we can work with is a very conventional quantum theory. So it's a completely ordinary quantum theory, no gravity. Uh, all the usual rules of quantum mechanics apply, and we have a distinguished notion of time. Okay, so in this holographic theory, we have something very, very conventional. It has a lot of degrees of freedom, which gives some interesting new phenomena, but otherwise it's completely conventional. And we recover this bulk space-time, the one with the extra dimension, by um, a non-local map that uh, has, has been well studied in the string theory community. So the consensus says that you can reconstruct the exterior space-time via this uh, framework very, very accurately, essentially to arbitrary precision. And the unitar unitarity is obvious in this framework from the point of view of the outside. Um, local correlations differ from what one would uh, compute using um, a thermal density matrix by corrections that are exponentially small in the entropy of the black hole. So tiny, tiny corrections um, due to the non-local effects that transfer the information from the inside to the outside are visible on the outside. And the question is then what happens uh, on the inside? And there are various uh, options here. There's the firewall proposal that essentially says that space-time ends on this line. Uh, there's this post-selection ideas, the horowitz moldacena kind of ideas that Seth talked about, uh, and the idea of complementarity that I'll say a few words about now. So with the idea of complementarity, we're essentially saying this outgoing Hawking radiation is in, has a dual interpretation, a complementary interpretation in terms of the state inside. Um, this is a little funny because some local interior observer or some set of states in the interior um, will correspond to some kind of macroscopic non-local superposition of different Hawking particles and, and vice versa. So if you have a localized set of Hawking particles coming out, um, they will correspond to some weird superposition of different uh, observers on the inside. And it's very hard to have two different local interpretations of the uh, evolution of this same state. So this leads one to the firewall point of view that just says that you, know, you can't do that. So let me show how you, you could try to reconstruct um, uh, a sensible quantum mechanics for an infalling observer. So if we look at the picture in uh, Kruskal coordinates, it looks more like this. Here I've zeroed in on the horizon. This is the singularity. And I view it as a success if I can construct uh, a sensible effective field theory for a single observer who falls across the horizon. In Kruskal coordinates, um, one has this uh, scaling property that if you do a time translation, um, you're essentially just rescaling uh, the, the Kruskal coordinates. 
So you get this kind of sequence of patches um, that are just a, a kind of a, a, a rescaled version of each other that go off until the end point of the black hole evaporation. So in quantum mechanics, we, we have this feature that uh, local interactions will decohere a quantum state. So once these Hawking particles come, start coming out, the clock starts ticking, and uh, we eventually will give up, after some finite amount of time, any possibility of having a local observer on the inside here experience uh, ordinary quantum mechanics. So th there's a nice uh, um, cooperation of the features of the dynamics of the black hole that, that seem to make it possible to define this effective field theory in this finite patch here. Uh, so if the length of this patch is of order the scrambling time of the black hole, and we can show that the decoherence time likewise is of order the uh, scrambling time of the black hole, um, you can construct an effective field theory in this region. So as we agreed before, outside, you can essentially build any local operator by this holographic construction. The Hamiltonian density is one of those local operators. So you can evolve your state into the interior. Now the missing ingredient here is you need to supply some extra boundary conditions on this uh, slice here. But the fact that uh, the one has this uh, rescaling where this whole uh, leg here gets rescaled into a Planck-sized leg over here means you actually only need to supply those boundary conditions within a Planck distance of this uh, stretched horizon. Um, uh, so so w with that in mind, it, one can build a regulated effective field theory here where one is introducing uh, this new boundary condition uh, within a Planck length of the stretched horizon, which is not unlike the kind of uh, strategy one takes in cosmological effective field theory, where uh, you work with a fixed proper length cutoff and put modes into their vacuum state um, as you evolve forward in time. So that gives a recipe then for taking this holographic description and patch by patch constructing uh, a sequence of effective field theories in the interior of the black hole. So let me end there, thanks. Uh, yep. uh, so in this, in this situation, uh, what if you fall across the horizon? So uh, consider some mode, as usual, in the zone uh, during the time that I'm just outside the red region. Yep. Um, and let me bring along, so this is an old black hole, let's say, so let me bring around, along an approximate purification of that mode from the early Hawking radiation. Yep. Um, and so now, uh, it wouldn't be consistent with any effective field theory as long as it's based on the laws of quantum mechanics for there to be the vacuum at the horizon for that mode. That's right. So then, uh, why is there the vacuum if I don't bring along the uh, purification? Let's see. So we, we can use the theory on the outside to set up uh, boundary conditions. Uh, along a time slice that perhaps looks something like this. Um, within this picture, there, there's no, um, for, for a generic state, if you compute the stress energy on the outside, it, it's not large, well, right? That's exactly the same as it would be in That's right. State, yeah. uh, so, I, I'm not sure. Well, I, I just don't see how this addresses the actual fireball argument. So if you bring along purification of a law which must exist at late times, then no matter how you construct an effective field theory that's supposed to mock up the interior, it's, it's not consistent in the involving observer's frame for there to both be a pure state that you can build up in the zone and the thing that you brought along, and also out of the outside zone in the interior. Uh, well, in, in this picture, it is, but I, I would have to get into some 
Uh, I'm not sure I can explain it in, in a few words. So. But we. Didn't fit on the margin. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's certainly true you can't uh, globally construct an effective field theory um, that would. Uh, or correspond to a usual global time slice. But I mean, I'm giving you an explicit construction of an impossible quantum state. You have to tell me what goes wrong. Right. We, have, we, have, we have, you know, qubits A, B, and C, and B and C together form an entangled pure state, and A and B together form an entangled pure state. Something has to go wrong. Something has that, to stop this from happening. That's right. So one has two complementary descriptions of the, the this, physics. I've given you this description in the infalling observer's frame only. So one, so one has not, that. I don't have to switch between two different observers to run into this contradiction. So I'm, I'm yeah, afraid the, we've lost most of the audience here in this, <laughs> in this discussion. So, so maybe. Well, the yeah. advantage of what David is saying is that one can have a coherent discussion about it. Uh, very few people have actually engaged with a firewall. Yes, so I, I, I would say that you do have a, a firewall if you, let your, if you set up your initial conditions here and talked about an observer crossing there. However, what I'm saying is if you put your initial conditions there and consider an observer crossing in this next patch, the firewall problem goes away. First patch, or next patch, I don't care, you pick. I, I, I just did. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the point is that all the, what you would usually think of as the interesting information in the quantum state here all hits the singularity within a scrambling time. So you're introducing some very harmless initial data here that an, ob so that a, an observer crossing here isn't really going to care about. On the other hand... I, I let you introduce anything you want, initial data wise. I'm just saying you have an impossible quantum state if there's, you, you, if there's vacuum in the horizon. You, you do have... An, whoops. You do have a, an impossible quantum state if you use the blue effective field theory in the red patch, but you're not supposed no, to I do know, that. I never go to the <laughs> red patch. Let's stay with the blue patch. Okay, so that, then I'm saying you have to set up the initial data for this patch by going back to here. That's fine. So your firewall would be here, but by the time no, you propagate forward in time and talk about the effective field theory up here, the firewall has gone away. <laughs> this is best discussed on the beach, clearly. <laughs> Are there any other questions uh, for David? Uh, so everyone agrees that there's no firewalls, but nobody agrees on why. Who agrees? Who is yeah. uh, <laughs> so, uh, Is this a religious convocation, or are we trying to figure something out? Well, you, you've told uh, us that there are no firewalls, but anybody, any reason that anyone has said why there aren't firewalls is incorrect. You told us that earlier. Or at least and, incomplete, yeah. And yeah. we've been told four different arguments, so I think None of those can be correct by your assertion. Yes. And I'm not sure that anything Well, I should know. I mean, hold it. Were you asking for a show of hands from the whole audience or from just the audience? And since Raphael is struggling with the complementarity principle in your different views, I guess, who feels that who thinks that there's no firewall in your hand? Probably not. Okay. David Finkelstein, would you like to raise your hand, please? Well, I would like to say I don't know whether there's a firewall or not, but I tend to err on the side of, of believing maybe not. How does any? How can anybody know if there's a firewall or not? Since it's, it, there's obviously a problem, and the firewall is one solution to it, Wait, and then there may be other solutions to it. But we don't. How is somebody gone in when tested his black hole to see what happens? My specific question is very short. It's for Raphael, and I'm wondering. What do you say to Andrew Hamilton's claim that uh, we can't just we no longer talk about the horizon and talking radiation is just come, it's not coming from the future horizon? I think this discussion would benefit from at least a brief summary of why there's a problem. And what I would then say to Andrew Hamilton's claim is that he, nothing he says has anything to do with this problem. Um, so uh, here is uh, here's an evaporating black hole. We can make it be already quite old. So you're assuming a classical space-time? Uh, are, are I'm, I'm assuming a classical space-time to the degree of approximation to which we're assuming it right now. So what's at stake here is the equivalence principle, that, that you know, the vacuum here is not different from the vacuum anywhere else. If that was the case, 
for example, because there are large corrections to a classical spacetime at a black hole horizon, that would violate the equivalence principle. We believe that if you have a black hole that's billions of light years across and you happen to cross its horizon, while it cannot arbitrarily precisely be described by a classical spacetime, it can be described to at least as good a precision as we describe this room by a classical spacetime. And that's the issue that's at stake, because the firewall tells us that it cannot. So it might be violated by a little bit. Well, the firewall argument tells you that it's violated by a lot. It would be OK for it to be violated by some uh, you know, numbers of order that are exponentially small that have to do with the finiteness of the size of the region that you have access to. Um, or some, you know, either some ratio of the distance scale that you have access to over the curvature radius. But I think that might be an important part of the argument because quantifying the kind of deviations. That's been done. I, I mean, I, I think there's a lot being said here that's just not very informed about what, what, what these people have done who came up with these arguments. They're not idiots. Um, they are aware of the fact that we can describe a finite region of space-time only with finite precision. That precision can be quantified. You can then ask, how bad is the firewall if we follow the argument? What does it lead to? It's significantly worse than this. It's an order one uh, correction at all scales uh, to what, what would happen in flat space. So that's the problem. I mean, if, it was, if we could just brush it under the usual carpet of, you know, there's finite precision when we examine finite regions, there are corrections from curvature, that'd be great. Nobody would be very excited right now. Um, so, uh, so good. So, but maybe I can just give a brief summary of what the problem is, and then I'll get out of the way and wait for the solution. Um, so, so if, in order for an observer here to see the vacuum, uh, we can write the usual vacuum on the scales that are smaller than the curvature scale, but much larger than the Planck scale, so it has to be a good approximation if we believe we understand this room. I can write the usual vacuum in terms of modes that have support inside and outside the horizon. We can al also do that in flat space. It's called Rindler. Um, it's called Rindler space, or writing the vacuum in the unroof form. And in that form, there is entanglement in Seth's uh, notation. I would draw a little smiley here. Um, there's an entanglement between the left and the right, and I could write down the full state, but let me, for the purposes of this discussion, write it as 0 left, 0 right, plus 1 left, 1 right. And now replace that with in and out, uh, out, in, out. OK, so this is some, you know, forget this normalizations, but uh, this, is, this is some EPR type state. This is what the vacuum actually looks like if you write it in this perverse way of, you know, having modes with support on one or the other side of a null surface. Um, and and uh, the important thing about this is that uh, S in is order one, S out is also order one because this is a highly entangled state. More precisely, each of these entropies is log two. For the true vacuum where you'd have higher expectation, um, higher occupation numbers involved, it'd be some other order one number, but it's, it's order one. But the entropy of in out together is zero because this is a pure state. The vacuum is a pure state. Um, all right, so now the subtle part of the argument has to do with the fact that uh, you're putting in the assumption of unitarity. And this is the only thing that's crazy here, because we still have no idea how the information actually gets out of the black hole. Okay, we have indirect arguments that would be terrible if it didn't, but that's an assumption that's being put in, and that's what, what conflicts with our, with our intuition, because, of course, um, if we just use the vacuum here at the horizon, well, Hawking already did this, and you find that no information comes out. <laughs> Uh, you can do that calculation. What we're doing now is running it backwards, assuming that information does come out and showing explicitly that this violates Hawking's assumptions of um, harmless horizon, even if uh, we allow ourselves the freedom of complementarity, even if we allow ourselves to say, well, once I'm inside the black hole, I can't talk to the guy outside anymore, and you know, that should give me some ways of reconciling things. It does in some cases, it doesn't here anymore. So what's the problem? Um, so uh, one of the wonderful things that Don Page taught us is that if you wait for a black hole to evaporate, uh, and let's say it has 90% evaporated, it's just important it's more than half, but uh, we, we made the black hole huge to start with, so it's still an enormous, perfectly harmless black hole. The horizon has low curvature, um, but 90% of the Hawking radiation is already out there. Well, any system, um, so, so now let me consider an infalling observer into that black hole. With, with only 10% of the original size left over. And let me consider uh, a, a wave packet, an outgoing wave packet, 
uh, in the region between the horizon and about uh, 1.5 times the horizon. Black hole is evaporating. It has evaporated already by 90 percent. Yeah. So <coughs> this horizon is the no, is the event horizon or is the shrunk horizon? What horizon? But then also, when, when, evaporate, when the horizon evaporate, if, if you write the... Yeah. So if you write the, the shrunk... They, they differ by a Planck distance. I mean, less than a Planck distance, but I mean, no, I'm no, just... No, no, no. They are, they're, they're a huge distance apart from one another. If I've evaporated by half, yeah. they are they're a different distance by half the mass of the black hole. No, yeah. that's, that's not yeah. true. Yes. Uh, the radius is half as big. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, but you're, you, no. What's, rele what's relevant is on some time slice now, how far the, yeah, I'm trying to, uh, how far these two horizons are apart on some time slice now. I mean, obviously, if it's 90% evaporated originally, the size of the event horizon was 10 times larger than it is now. Um, but, but, um, but there's no confusion about where the event horizon is. If you, if you had a black hole right now, you wouldn't get confused about where the event horizon is. You could, you could un unless you throw enormous amounts of matter into it later on. Um, be because... <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's this. What does it trick? I don't it, understand. The event horizon trips. <coughs> if I write the Schwarzschild and instead of m, I write m of t, and I keep track of the back reaction by having m of t slowly decreasing in t, okay, then the uh, r equal to m surface is not an event horizon because it's not a lifelike -like surface, it's a time like surface. But Rob Hill's just saying that that's very close to the event horizon. No, it's not. It's very far. As a Carlo, that's just factually incorrect. So it's not very far. If, if I draw any slice here, the apparent horizon and the event horizon are super exponentially close together at all times during the evaporation process. It, it, this is a fact of general relativity. Uh, I, I don't know if any other general relativists want to. We don't have to do this by voting. We, you, you can do the calculation. Uh, it's, 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 I mean, you're, you're not seriously saying that if I have a black hole that's, uh, you know, a light year across, I need to know, uh, you know, I, I, it, it's described to good approximation over short time scales by the Schwarzschild geometry. That's, that's what's being assumed here. Uh, and that's what's supported by all the calculations. Well, a short time compared to the evaporation time scale. Here we're talking about an infalling observer. He doesn't wait that long. You know, he's, he's, uh, so this could be a long time scale compared to the Schwarzschild radius, but a short time scale compared to the evaporation time. Then what I said is correct. I think it takes a long time from the you from far away. Well, let's, let's, let's follow from 100 times the Schwarzschild radius. It doesn't. It's from far away. No, but Who cares about you in far away? I'm, 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 I'm. Falling time is at So if, if, you're, if M is very big and flaky, if it's N cube, it's enormously bigger than M. Yeah. So, so in any case, I am interested in the description of an observer who is falling in, or at least who is approaching the black hole right now. We'll, we'll still decide whether he falls in in just a second. Okay. So, uh, so it's not that difficult, right? You fly into the near horizon zone. Um, but, but I want you to fly. So um, I got interrupted. I don't know exactly where. But what I wanted to say is this. So remember, I was basically focusing on some, on some wave packet on some Rindler type wave packet inside and outside the black hole and saying they have to be so entangled. They're, they're highly entangled, order one entropy for each side, but together they're pure. Um, the assumption of, of uh, unitarity implies that, well, if I had access to the entire Hawking radiation, I could then consider the entire Hawking radiation minus that one wave packet, minus that one qubit, and of course, it would be true, if I assume unitarity, that those two things together, let's call it, uh, well, I don't know how I'm going to call it, final minus out. So out is this guy. This is the in guy. Here is all of the final radiation arriving at infinity. Um, those two things together also have to purify each other, because I'm assuming that final as a whole is pure. Again, that's something we can, if we give up that assumption, there's no problem. So I'm assuming here unitarity. Um, and, and that's okay. That in itself would not yet be a problem because the guy who's jumping in, um, of course, doesn't have access to the complete out state. And so at this level, there's no contradiction if we appeal to, to complementarity. Okay. The problem comes about because if the black hole has already, been, has already evaporated more than half, it is possible to extract from the radiation that's already come out 
an almost exact purification. It's the entropy of out and some other bit that we might call out bar, uh, which I already have access to at a finite time before I jump in, that entropy together is almost exactly zero. So S out, out bar is almost exactly zero. Um, but, but again, you know, the, so, so, so then I have a pure state that I can form out of out and some bit in the early Hawking radiation. Okay? And those two things are uh, a contradiction just with quantum mechanics. So, so this is a, a, a theorem in quantum mechanics. Uh, it's called the uh, strong subadditivity of the entanglement entropy. But roughly speaking, you can understand it very well by thinking about EPR states. If you have two spins that are entangled with each other, um, you know, 0, 0, plus 1, 1 type thing, uh, and you assume that the second spin is also so entangled with a third spin in forms of pure state, then you could project the third spin onto x up and the first spin onto z down, and the middle spin wouldn't know what to do. That'd be, uh, that'd be a con You could steer the middle st spin to anything you want, including two contradictory states. So you can't have this situation. And the problem is that this situation is arising in the frame of the infalling observer alone, or to be precise. Okay, and this is, this is an important point. If I fall in, I can measure both out and out bar. I can, I can take out bar along, extract it from the Hawking radiation, bring it here to near the horizon, and I can check, if I wish, that out and out bar are in the correct entangled pure state that's demanded by unitarity. I have to be able, I have to get that. Because after all, I still have the option of flying out and being an outside observer. Let me just finish, Carl, and then I'll take your question if that's okay. Um, and being an outside observer, so complementarity or not, um, I have to insist that out and out bar are in the correct entangled pure state. And now I still have that option of either jumping in or going back out. But if I now jump in, well, it's too late. I can't write down a quantum state for myself in this room uh, where, I, where, where, where this one um, bit out is purified both by something called in and by something I have in my pocket uh, called out bar. I would end up with three bits in an impossible, um, in an impossible quantum state. Uh, and that's, that's sort of the, the, the very brief summary of the argument. Carlos, sorry. Can I, can I just make a comment here? since? Uh, so the question had to do with what you thought. I was, I was saying it was wrong. I would like an opportunity to respond. But Carla, go ahead. Oh, well, yes, yeah, the question was by George Dove. So you have to work that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Very nice that you want to so, Raphael, first of all, I, I want to say I, I really appreciated the papers that you've written, many of the papers I learned about the covariant entropy bound from you, and a lot of what you say has made a lot of... No, no, you can insult me without complimenting me first. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> We're all... Uh... I, I was happy to, to hear you enunciate all of the no-no words that, that I... Yes, here. yes, I was happy to do that, because I have no idea why calling them no-no words solves any problem. <laughs> Um, I'm in particular saying that the interior is observer dependent, and you really yeah. confirm this notion that there is no doubt where the event horizon is. There is no doubt where it is, yes. Absolutely, and I would say the event horizon's got absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the quantum mechanics of the system. It's not where Hawking radiation comes from, and it's not where the states of the black hole reside. And, uh, uh, allow me to go ahead here. So you passed the the black hole into interior and exterior states. Now, I would say that that is an observer-dependent statement. Now, when you actually do the calculations, as I showed you, of what somebody sees when they fall into a black hole, when they pass through the future event horizon, they don't meet anything special there. The thing that is carrying, that is emitting Hawking radiation from their perspective, and is, if you want, carrying the states of the black hole, is this illusory horizon ahead of them. And the affine distance between the, the, that illusory horizon and the event horizon that you've fallen through, the future event horizon, is finite and calculable, and it's large. 
So the notion that when you that there is anything like, for example, a near horizon zone is, is vastly observer dependent. From the perspective of an, of an outside observer, when Alice falls through the event horizon, okay, or near the event horizon, she's in the near horizon zone. But when she falls through, as far as she's concerned, she's still nowhere near this illusory horizon which is the carry, carries the state to the black hole. Now, if we look at another situation which we're quite familiar with, that of Decida space, for example, I think no one would contend that the, that the horizon of, of, of the Decida space is observer dependent. It's a sphere around that observer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what that observer would call the near horizon zone, if, if another person went to, to try to go up to that horizon and say, is there anything there, they wouldn't find anything. In fact, the person who went to the horizon of the uh, first observed... That's observer, completely correct, they yeah. Went up there, they yeah. Would, they would Th find this is not like the sitter space. Yes. Yeah. Uh, from the point of view of... Yeah, but using that as, uh, analogy, the interior of the black hole is analogous to the region outside an observer's horizon in the sitter space. It's the part that's inaccessible to them. Uh, and it's that part beyond the observer's horizon that... That we, that we essentially require the emitting in a non-local fashion, the Hawking radiation that you see from that is coming from that. So let me make one more statement about, about this and then, then I'll hand this back. It seems to me that if you make the assumption that as soon as Alice falls to the horizon from the perspective of an, of an outside observer, if you assume that she having fallen through the event horizon. Let us assume that Bob is watching Alice fall through the horizon of the black hole. As far as he's concerned, when she hits the event horizon, as it looks to him, uh, then beyond that point, she's essentially inside the black hole. And you would say that the Hawking radiation is, is then available uh, from her, effectively, uh, describing the states of that person inside the black hole inside the black hole. That immediately leads to a contradiction. Because as long as Bob can fall in and catch up with Alice and make a classical comparison of, of what's going on, you are going to get a contradiction. This is why I insisted that if one is going to get a consistent... Uh, we're piling up too many things that I won't all be able to answer to before I forget the first one. So can I pause you for just a second? Okay. Um, let me start with the very last thing you said. This is a famous contradiction that, that uh, indeed, if I if I were able to get information back out in Hawking radiation too quickly, then I could jump in and see another copy of the information inside. Um, and so it's been argued plausibly, but not proven, that it takes at least a scrambling time for the information to come back out. Otherwise, we would have additional problems. Um, and and if, if it takes that long, then it's not possible because of the redshift that you know very well about uh, to actually receive a bit of information inside the black hole. But, but maybe I can just br briefly comment on, on two things. Um, one is more general. A lot of the things you say are true, but do not engage with this argument. For example, I was very specific about which observer I am constructing an an, an, a, a contradiction for. But um, more uh, specifically, you talk a lot about the difference between the boundary of the causal patch of an infalling observer and that of an outside observer. The argument is being specifically made with reference to the event horizon, so to the boundary of the causal patch of an outside observer. And when I say something like near horizon zone, it refers to that horizon. An argument is then made that an infalling, maybe infalling <coughs> observer, somebody who approaches uh, the, uh, the neighborhood of that particular surface, which is well determined to exponential accuracy, uh, if we believe in semi-classical gravity, uh, if that observer must be able to construct a pure state out of modes in that region and, and, and quanta he brings along from the early Hawking radiation. And so that observer cannot also find those modes in that region purified by the interior as required for free fall across this outside event horizon. The fact that this infalling observer, if they do get in, have a different horizon is completely peripheral to the argument. It has nothing to do with it. It's true, but it, it, it's just unrelated to the argument. Okay, uh, can I respond to, to that? Uh, you said very specifically you were talking about the causal patch of an outside observer. <coughs> if that outside observer chooses to fall in, then that causal patch of the outside observer is not 
any longer what you were describing. No, this is a geometry, right? It, it, it's, uh, I'm talking about the region of space that we could be sitting in right now. Yes. I, it seems, uh, first of all, uh, Raphael admires you even more than I do about that. Does this mean you're going to attack me even more? <laughs> It seems to me. Can somebody just like not admire me? <laughs> um, it seems to me that you are, there is some hidden assumption in what you're uh, saying. I and, also. And yeah, and uh, uh, I want to uh, present a, a, an example that I believe makes this hidden assumption come out. Uh, so the example is the example is the following. Suppose that. Um, uh, in the, I would correct classical generativity only in the very high curvature region, which you would allow me here, it seems to me. The very high curvature region would mean near the, 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 the true singularity of the Michael. In fact, I want to correct it in the way that seems plausible to me as a physicist going back to graduate what would happen. And what seems plausible to me that could happen is that uh, uh, quantum gravity creates a strong repulsive force there. So there is a hardcore, uh, like, uh, Paulier pulsing, exactly like the, the electron folding of the um, R equals zero, the Kuno potential, so it stays up. So if so, my metric is going to be uh, corrected on R equals zero, so I can draw a picture with a <coughs> Penrose diagram of that, then the Penrose diagram, no surprising, it's going to be like Minkowski. And there are two troubles. Uh, one which corresponds to what you call the, the horizon outside, which you're constantly referring to, and one which is the inside one, which you're going to meet at some point in the future, after which uh, all the Hawking radiation, uh, uh, radiation has gone out. And uh, this is a perfect consistent system. It's the same as general relativity everywhere except in the very high uh, curvature region. There is no event horizon. So clearly, something you have. Where is your extra? Where is your extra input here? I think that has to do with something called the Busser of Raphael Busser entropy bound and something like that. <laughs> and uh, but it's definitely there because there is no event horizon if you change something about the physics. Not at the, not at what you call the horizon, but in a completely different region, which is the article uh, near the article zero thing. So there is a reasonable scenario which is that uh, the uh, 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 information is still uh, there somewhere, it leaks out slowly, That's and the confusion, in my opinion, is a confusion about where the horizons is. There's an idea that in a small amount of time, the horizon doesn't change much. It's a null surface. Uh, uh, something which is almost a null surface is not a null surface, right? This is, is a big point. I mean, if there is Hawking radiation, what you call the horizon is not a null surface. And something which is almost not a null surface is completely not at all a null surface. And that makes a huge difference. So this well... Uh, no, I, so I think there's really a lot of confusion about this that I find uh, strange. I mean, so if you have that, a large that, black hole... Sorry, sorry, let me make, the the let me make a one, one, it, it one sentence the question to you. Yeah. In the, uh, Scenario that I gave you. So it's a hardcore R equals zero, so the Penrose diagram is the same as Mikowski. Where is the problem? Uh, to, you're either modifying the geometry on the scale of the Schwarzschild radius or not. If, if you're not, then it should be described uh, approximately, very good approximation by a Schwarzschild solution up to the Schwarzschild radius and somewhat beyond. That's all that's being assumed in this argument. One thing that you said may suggest that you're assuming that the uh, um, that you're considering a remnant scenario where the information doesn't that actually kill. No, then, then, yeah, then that's my answer. So, so nothing that you said, I mean, either you have to, to change the geometry at the Schwarzschild radius in that region, in which case that's basically what firewalls are already doing, it seems no, pretty terrible. Right. Or if not, then, then none of what you said changes the argument I just gave. Uh, can you ask us? Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. So Raphael, I hate your work. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree with you. <laughs> well, I had to do it. I mean, yeah, you know, it's like just to be fair. Yeah. Complimentary. That's not what's 
So, and in fact, let me, let me, I'm actually myself I'm getting quite a bit more than lost in, in these discussions about which patches is which and which horizon is which. So, but, but I, I mean, look, this is just a quantum information theory comment. So, <clears throat> if you just look at the, you know, all the stuff I've learned from people like like Don Page um, uh, about quantum field theory of curved space time. If something, if some quantum information falls into a black hole and gets out again, then something is really screwed up. I think this is, I mean, <laughs> this is, <clears throat> so what's screwed, so this is, this is undeniable. And so what's screwed up? Well, if it falls in and gets out, then no cloning is violated. Moreover, for the reasons that Raphael was describing and I alluded to, if the thing that falls in was entangled to something outside, then monogamy of entanglement is violated. Now, you can't violate no cloning without having the system be not unitary. And even worse, you can't violate monogamy of entanglement without having, that, that means that your state picture of quantum mechanics doesn't work. So, I mean, something really is screwed, I mean, it's really, not only is it screwed up, it's really screwed up from our, our ordinary picture. Um, so, and this is true even if the overall time evolution is not perfectly unitary. It just has to get a little bit of stuff out of it. So, through the firewall, which, I mean, I, I, though I find the firewall implausible in some way, at least it does address the issue. It says, okay, well, if something comes in and gets out, then everything's screwed up. So, let's just say it doesn't go in. I mean, this is the motivation for the firewall at some level. Let's, like, keep it from falling in, and that will certainly help with these problems because it never falls in and gets out. Um, but I, I don't, I mean, I don't, though I think the firewall is kind of implausible and I prefer some other, you know, solution like, for instance, this final state projection model, I think that the, the motivation for trying to, to, to say, well, you know, that something is wrong is, is very much there. And I don't know which is true. I mean, it would be, it's too bad that we can't actually do experiments on actual black holes, but for a closed time like curve, uh, uh, modeling, we asked the, um, if we could actually take two black holes in the laboratory and construct those like the time like curves between them, but the facilities people at MIT and the workplace safety people objected to this because, you know, the fools like standing in the way of science is terrible. <clears throat> so, but I, I think that this is, I mean, this is an issue that is not resolved. It's an interesting issue. There really is a problem. And I think even in, in, though I tend to agree with the picture that you have, which I think that fact would would make the, I think this is consistent with these final state projection models. But, and, but uh, it, there's definitely a problem there. So, it, it, something has to be done. If there is no event horizon, why is there a problem? Oh, if, if information is going to escape from a, a black hole, then there's a problem um, with our ordinary picture of quantum mechanics. You have to add something that, you know, because of these, these problems like uh, monogamy and entanglement. No, but it could be a problem with the quantum mechanics of the space time. The sure. The inside outside have to be with the problem. No, that, that, I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. I'm not going to show these are different solutions for the quantum mechanics. It's a system with a quantum mechanics. It's another. Okay, let me draw one more. Let me draw one more. Oh, thank you. No, 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 no. There are two traps. Why don't you draw it? <laughs> I think that this conversation shows that passions run higher in, in, in our passions run high in inverse proportion to the experimental evidence. <laughs> it's kind of like it's kind of like academic disputes. They're 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 so violent because the stakes are so small. What, what I find interesting about this argument is that, that it seems like not even everybody draws quite the same conformal diagram, and yeah, when you don't have that, it's kind of like your help. It's not sure what it's not clear what you have. Just want to comment while people are drawing hand those diagrams. <laughs> the general relativity does make a very clear prediction that something goes wrong at the singularity. I don't think that so yes, there is an issue here, but general relativity also says this is the open door to, to where things are going wrong. I think the error that is going on here is, is the proposition that the event horizon 
the, the surface of the overturn, which I claim has got absolutely nothing to do with Hawking radiation, it's got absolutely nothing to do with the, uh, with the interior states of the black hole. And the only time that the horizon is a boundary is to the future of observers who have watched the black hole evaporate. Then it's a true boundary. As long as you're outside the black hole and you can fall in, that event horizon is not a boundary. It's only as long as you stay outside that it's, it's a boundary. So I think I agree with that. So you have to have an alternative argument. You have to go all the way around <coughs> the distance of the evaporation. Well, I think that, that as long as you stay outside the horizon and don't have anybody falling in, I don't see how you can get a firewall paradox because there's nobody testing that firewall. So, yeah. so I guess my take on the firewall is that it's not really different from this no cloning argument that was made long ago. In yeah. fact, it's not really that different from thinking about the, the original Bulware fashion that people thought about in the 1970s and found that the stress and energy tensor was actually divergent outside the horizon. So for most of the potential firewall states, people construct that work very hard to get one that's not singular or already outside the horizon. Um, so that, that's one point. And that, I think the uh, loophole in Raphael's argument for the firewall was that this application of local quantum field theory inside this horizon. Um, the idea of black hole complementarity says you, you're just not allowed to, to do that. You immediately run into this quality problem. So you, you have to do something different. So in the framework I was trying to describe, you, you actually have a, a different framework for an observer crossing the horizon, already outside, certainly inside, versus uh, your description that uh, extends to asymptotic infinity. And they disagree within um, a region outside the horizon. The question is whether that is a large disagreement or not. And I would point in that framework <coughs> that, uh, the, 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 the corrections are, are so small they're never measurable by the can I ask you a question about those? So uh, when you accept a deviation from unitarity uh, of, of the order of the size of these corrections? Well, in the framework I gave, the, the, it, it wasn't strictly unitary. OK, so, so and, the, and, the, and these deviations are the size of e to the minus s squared. Yeah. yeah, OK. That's interesting, because that's actually you know this scrambling, as I mentioned, in this scrambling model inside the whole of the projection that's just yep. what you get as well. I wonder, I mean, this, this is like, this is one of these blind men with an elephant kind of conversations. Speak for yourself. Speak for yourself. Who's blind and who's the elephant? Yeah, Raphael's the elephant. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think this was going to get physical. Can, can I ask a more um, less ambitious question? Less ambitious question. I, I would just like to get a sense of whether there's agreement on where the Hawking radiation comes from. Um, because I, I think that Andrew was basically saying that, you know, if I if we think about a, a pure Schwarzschild, we can think about a pure Schwarzschild diagram or a collapsing star Schwarzschild diagram, just when the star has kind of recently collapsed being here. Or a long time after the star has collapsed, it looks more like this. This is what we showed yesterday. So, so I think Andrew's claim is that the hot radiation is really coming from here. The hot radiation is all the way up here. We don't see it on the diagram. Here, it's coming from this surface. If I have this right. Yes. Here, presumably, it's really coming from that surface. If we draw the diagrams like this. Is, is that right according to your view? Why does it matter? I would just like to know. <laughs> it's, not, it's not part of I mean, I, I asked this to almost everybody who said something. No, nobody's engaging with this argument. I, I it it I doesn't said, speak to this argument. I don't care. I would like to know what I'm My own pure intellectual curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to know. It's a very poorly defined question because it becomes transplanting as you run it back far enough. Right, but right. you can make the argument without running it back that far, I and then you know where want, it comes from. I don't from. care about firewalls at the moment. I just want to know what you think about where the operators come from. That's what I said. It's a very much less ambitious question. If I look at the bottom diagram, I think that is correct. I think in the top diagram, in the eternal Schwarzschild black hole, that raises a whole other issue of what boundary conditions you choose to impose. 
at, at, at the horizon. Uh, in, in reality, nature imposes boundary conditions. It is not mathematicians who impose boundary conditions. A mathematician can choose what boundary conditions they, they like in the eternal black hole, but in the actual astrophysical black holes, it is nature that chooses those boundary conditions. And the, those boundary conditions include collapsing stuff. So, so can I just clarify? Because so I, I want to understand this question as well. So, so for, for folks who are outside the, the collapsing star, they see the Hawking radiation uh, being emitted from the redshifted surface of the star where they last saw it coming from. Is that where, where, where after it collapsed? Right, well, classically, the, the star that collapses through its horizon appears to freeze at the horizon, right. and then it continues to redshift exponentially into the indefinite future, and classically, you never see anything fall through the thing, but, uh, but again, classically, it's dimming and redshifting to in invisibility. Uh, but where, uh, where the, the quantum field theory comes in is the fact that you've got this redshifting surface where classically everything's redshifted to, to nothing, but when you Fourier transform essentially the, the, the pure modes of frequency that are uh, that would be emitted, if you like, but are not being emitted because they're no longer there, that could be emitted uh, from the horizon by an, an infrared, they Fourier transform into a range of positive and negative frequencies, mode by mode. And when you do that calculation, that, that, as we've all done each of us 10 to the six times, uh, you, you find a thermal that the, 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 what the observer sees is spontaneous emission with a thermal spectrum. So we're um, emerging from this, this uh, redshifted this it's, it, it's precisely because you see a redshifting, an exponentially redshifting yeah. screen. There's, there's nothing magic about that. You can make it a black hole, you can make it a city space, you can make it a grid space, it doesn't yeah. matter. It's all the same thing. And similarly for the person who falls into the hole, they see internal radiation being emitted from the, the thing that's falling down and falling in front of them. Exactly. Just because you fall through the event horizon, the black hole, doesn't mean that you suddenly catch up with this redshifted surface. It doesn't mean it suddenly disappears. Granted that you have very little time before you get the singularity to do any experiments, but it would be absolutely amazing if generalized thermodynamics or thermodynamics of some form or other did not hold for an infalling observer. Okay. And I would, so I was impatiently waiting, so I wanted to give him a chance to, to talk about his moral diagram, and also, if he wants to criticize either this one or this one, <laughs> where I can do it. So, uh, well, I don't want to take the, you know, take over the panel, so. Just, uh, maybe you I, I think that uh, uh, my impression is that, uh, after all, a lot of confusion comes from still thinking uh, sort of non relativistically in spite of everything. So that's, uh, this is what I think what happened, but it's not very really important. I don't want to convince at all you that this is what happened in each because of course I would fail if I would do that. But I think this point out to the set to see if you're moving with. Oh, sorry. Could you pull it back away from me faster and faster? faster. <laughs> 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 that's right. I want to see that on here. So this is a sort of intuitive picture. So I want to give you a scenario, which seems to me, uh, in parentheses, is what I think is likely. Now. Seems to me it's pointing out the hidden assumption in the story. And the scenario is the following. Uh, near our zones, near here, okay, there is some strong quantum gravity effect, which uh, intuitively is, is the one that you look on the computer in, in, in cosmology. It's a repulsive. In fact, you can write down a metric explicitly with that. It's a metric that satisfies the Einstein equation everywhere except in, in, in the region. And uh, what happens is that suddenly the Penrose diagram changes dramatically. And uh, if you want, this is the intuitive uh, picture. The light cone here bends, they go inside, but here they uh, turn up, upside again. So there's a strong core <coughs> where things matter falls in the space in, and then slowly leaks out. Now the key point is that if you do the Penrose diagram of this, the, the clean one, you see that uh, this surface here, which is the one you call horizon all the time, is on the light surface, of course, because the mass is decreasing. So slowly, this surface here is this one. The surface we keep talking about is not a... a... So the Hawking radiation is received here, and is received and not always at the same point. Hawking radiation in this diagram here, which one is the standard one? This one. It's all here. And 
this point, the cross-circuit in the but this line is not a light line, it, it, it falls because of back reaction. So organization goes to strike plus all through this region. So the information that falls in has all the time of falling out here or here. And the, uh, uh, the quantum gravitational part is the, the, the where you have to correct the metric. It's not a large one, it's a small one at the, uh, at the end. So here I'm giving a scenario, which of course might be plausible. I mean, I don't believe it for some other reasons, because I don't believe it's really right here. But I don't see where, I mean, is there a tangle between this and this and this point? Whatever happens, whatever story you have, you, have, you can have a unitary evolution on scry plus uh, without anything disappearing uh, or, any, or anything else. I don't see the need of correcting quantum mechanics here. You can say, yes, but maybe some version, and that's what I might want to say, some version of the entropy bound is violated in this case. It might be because this is a small area. Where's the apparent horizon in this diagram? Uh, the, the two trapped horizons. One is sort of the, uh, you see the black hole, this is what, what you would call the, what, what is approximated by the, by the event horizon of the approximation which you is about. And then inside, at the one, uh, at the few Planck distances, in fact, not a few Planck distances. No, the, the, the usual one, just the one that's usually near the event horizon, where is that? This one. So, this, the, 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 this one. So, so for, no for a long how does that get, go back to zero radius in this picture? Uh, because at the end of the evaporation process, it has to have zero radius, so I don't understand the picture. This is small area. This point here is small area. But the left, the left edge is zero radius, right? Sorry? The left as, uh, edge is zero radius. Is, is that point there a Planck radius or something? The, air, the radius is hard to say, area. Right? Yeah, area. So, so what, it has to go down so to zero area. So this is small, well, I wouldn't say Planck. I would say it depends on the mass which is inside. It's such that the, you want the energy density here should be Planck here. No more than Planck here. This is a, this is a generally detailed. Generally fails when the energy density goes to Planck scale, not, not when you go to Planck scale. I think this is important. Yeah. So if you have a lot of mass, uh, you are away from Planck length, but you are raw. Uh, you, you start correcting generativity when raw energy density goes to raw Planck. Uh, I believe. No, yeah. I don't believe. But this is this is what I think. Uh, in these yeah. So this is the area uh, at which uh, uh, still quantum mechanics, uh, all in all this region here, quantum mechanics uh, sort of violates classical generativity. So how else can I utter clarification here? But first of all, I think we all agree that Penrose diagram can be incredibly misleading because they distort space-time in you know, all kinds of ways. The time from here for me is extremely small. This is extremely small. Right. But so, so, that's, so, I'm, so, I'm, I'm using what you're saying, right? This, the, 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 the different observers here have different uh, so, horizons. So let, 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 let me put my question here. As long as you've got a very big evaporating black hole, a black hole in the center of an empty second or something like that, yeah. it's very closely described by a classical approximation. And there is a null surface, the one that we call the future event horizon. A null surface? A null surface which divides. This one. Yes, which, which is a 45 degree line. Which, now, when, which when, doesn't arrive, but the point is that if you demand to be unitary from here and here, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. now, it does, does seem to me there is an surface which is effectively dividing the, uh, the interior from the exterior from the point of view of the who remains outside the, the horizon forever. I, I would be inclined to think that there might be some curvature if there are some, if you're talking about uh, black holes which are getting down to you know, several Planck masses or something like that, and, and then general relativity is modifying things, and then I, I wonder whether the Penrose diagram description becomes valid at all. So I'm, my question is, what regime are we in here? Are we in, in, in a near quantum regime of a small black evaporating black hole? I, 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 I used to think that uh, the, the only way out of this story is to keep in mind that Penrose diagram don't apply at all. We are outside. We are living in a quantum area. You really have to think about quantum superposition space time and so on. But I changed my mind, and I think that uh, it is sufficient to um, uh, think that there is a regime in which quantum effects can just be seen in, in this regime, in this approximation, as uh, the violation of classical Einstein equations uh, in some region of space time, which is, which is this one. Uh, so, uh, what I'm talking about is uh, a classical metric 
which uh, uh, satisfy the Eiffel equation all over except in a high curvature uh, region uh, in such a way that uh, everywhere except when there is very high matter density, it is standard generativity, the big black hole you're talking about is here, but I'm pointing out that if there is back reaction, there is a small, slow decrease of the um, charge radius r equal to m in time. So r equal to m, uh, m is time dependent, is not a known surface, is a time-lapse surface, which slowly moves away, slowly moves away from the, so in other words, uh, things keep leaking out even classically uh, because of the back reaction. This is the, the, the fact. Yeah, the, the usual story is, yeah, but this is small. That's fine. But it piles up in the history of the black hole, oh. and it piles up more and more and more. So whatever is the story, it, in the end the story, the where the back reaction is, how can you say there's a contradiction here? Oh. I mean, it's obvious. Things can be entangled with something else. Oh, if, you trace the, if, you took the, the, if you took the pure state of the final stride and you traced over the last bit, so, yeah, uh, trace over the very last bit, so now you've now you got the, the density matrix to the entropy of that. Is that entropy of order n squared, or what's the, how, how big is the entropy there? Is there any entanglement, is there entanglement coming out before you get to that, that, that second line, or not? Yes, I would say yes. That there is entanglement. It is so in other words, in other words, the information is coming out slowly in the, in the usual picture. Yes. And that, how does it, I mean, if you had a very definite space time in quantum field theory, I mean, how is it, I mean, you might think it should be like Hawking's calculation where you did not, I mean, Hawking's calculation, you know, didn't give entanglement between them different modes. I mean, we now believe with unitary there is entanglement. So in your picture, what is giving the entanglement between the, between the different parts of that early part of scribe. Well, because the, 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 the information that comes in comes out. You're just so declaring that that happens. One side of the, of, of the, of the trapped horizon here it can just come out. The, the, the modes continue. It could be that the distant states are entangled with the distant geometry. That's not really not high in the survey. Many of the things you guys say could be true, but none of them go into this argument. I'm sorry to sound like a broken record. And, and, and for example, this argument involves no assumptions about what happens deep inside the black hole and near the singularity. So either you're reproducing the assumptions I made, or you're not. If you're not, you're doing something radical, because none of these assumptions involve anything non radical. What is the difference between this situation and an electric field where there's pair creation? So there's pair creation of some kind. Later on, there is some other big creation. So you can still say, well, there is information, uh, there is entanglement between uh, previously meter pair and there is also a maximum entanglement between the uh, later meter pair. I think what you are assuming here, the, the, the hidden assumption here, is that uh, the, uh, there is a, uh, all the information of the theory uh, uh, that is going to raise this future part and have recovered all the information from here to here. We are the unitarity from here to here. I don't know exactly what these lines mean, but I thought the second line was the one that the end point of the Hawking radiation. That's where the last Hawking quantum arrives, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so so that's... there's still a lot of stuff. That well, what, what, it, com it comes from where? Well, that, 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 that will be a remnant theory. So then you're saying that this... This right. black. This is kind of this is kind of cost here. Cost well, that's that's what Don was asking. That's what I'm trying to figure out. There's a lot of is there a lot of entanglement with that last stuff, in which case it's a remnant, or is all the information come out by the time you get to your second line as you go up? Because th this would invalidate one of my assumptions, which is that I can construct the out bar out of the out of the early Hawking radiation when 90% have evaporated. I would not be able to do that in your picture but it would be a dramatic modification of, of the way that, that, that uh, radiation comes out because you would have to get arbitrarily much information out of the final burst of a Planck-sized black hole. So, so, I so it doesn't matter how much. Your question is about this point or this point? The second one. The, yeah, the, the, the one you're pointing to now. Uh, I'm just asking, how, how much is, have you gotten all the information out or almost all the information out by there or not? No. I think it might be time to liberate the audience from the black hole of our discussion. <laughs>